Trinity Corner. <laughs> All right. In today's Trinity Corner, we are going to be talking more Old Testament, more biblical theology, and this is going to get fun and oh, deep. Oh, but I was going to say, please start sending in your questions about the Trinity stuff as he's talking too. Yeah. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking primarily at uh, Genesis 18 and 19 and talking about the all of the different plurality stuff going on with God in that passage. We're going to be looking here at starting Genesis 18. So I'm not going to read the entire passage because it is not um, something that needs every little detail talked about because we are going to talk about some details in detail. <laughs> but um, but we're going to get into a lot of the, the stuff here. So... Um, now these these two chapters are often overlooked when studying the Trinity, but I think they raise a lot of questions. And and as we're we're doing in our our series here, we're we're studying biblical theology, so we're we're taking the text as it is, and not and trying to like leave our our theology at the door and just try to understand what what the original readers would have would have understood. So the background this is part of the Abrahamic narrative. It's you know. The Abrahamic narrative starts at Genesis 12. Um, there's a there's a very clear break in Genesis at the end of chapter 11, where prior to that, up to that point, God is dealing with all of humanity, either through an, a representative like Adam or Noah or not, uh, like at the Tower of Babel, but he's kind of dealing with humanity as a whole up until that point. But then starting in chapter 12, this is where God calls Abraham and Abraham becomes you know, the, the father of the nation, the, the people who, through whom God will will have his covenants and all of that. Um, so we're, we're talking here about an, the appearances of Yahweh. And this appearance, what we're going to look at here in chapter 18, is, a, is really a culmination. Um, I've talked about this in an earlier episode of the show, but I want to give it a little more attention here. So it's preceded by three occurrence, three appearances, three times Yahweh shows up or at least I believe it's Yahweh in, in all three of these appearances it's three times that the name shows up and there's interaction going on uh, the first is Genesis 12 like I mentioned that one says Yahweh you know Yahweh said to to Abraham and, and that kind of stuff then in Genesis 15 is the second time and that is the word of Yahweh appeared to Abraham and that's an amazing passage we will go over at some point in this series as well but um, the Hebrew for that is Devar Yahweh. So you got Yahweh, then you got Devar Yahweh, which is understood as word of Yahweh, and then the angel of Yahweh or Malak Yahweh, and that is in, in Genesis 16, and that's actually appearing to Hagar. Um, and there's a lot of interesting things there. But what I just want to focus on right now as it relates to this particular um, spot in, in, in the narrative here in chapter 18 is that we have three appearances and all three appearances have a different sort of variation of the name. You have Yahweh, Word Yahweh, Devar Yahweh, and Messenger Yahweh, which is really what Malak means. Um, these three names appear, each, so each time it's different. And then the fourth appearance is here in, in Genesis 18. So Genesis 18, um, Verses 1 and 2 start this way. It says, and I'm reading from, someone asked last time what translation I'm using. This is called the Lexham English Bible. I mentioned it before. It's the default one made by Logos uh, for their Bible software. Uh, and I think it's a really great Bible. One of the reasons is it says Yahweh. I really like that. So um, so it says, Yah verse 1 and 2, it says, And Yahweh appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, and he was sitting in the doorway of the tent at the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, three men were standing near him. And he saw them and ran from the doorway of the tent to meet them and bowed <coughs> them to the ground. So, first thing we see in this setup is that 
Yah it says Yahweh appeared to him, and that that him is Abraham. Um, he appeared to him and said, and and when when he lifts his eyes and looks, he's what does he see? He sees three men. So that's that's just interesting on its own. Is that it says Yahweh appeared, but what it actually appeared? Three men. So the question at this point that everyone should be thinking is, what's going on? Is is Yahweh one of these men? Hmm. None of these men is somehow. What is God being described as all three of these men? What's going on? This this is ambiguous. We need some resolution here. It's creating some tension, and I think that's on purpose. Um, verses three and four says, uh, and he said, "My Lord, if I found favor in favor in your eyes." Do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought to wash your feet and rest under the tree. And let me bring a piece of bread and then refresh yourselves after you can pass on once you have passed by with uh, with your servant. Then they said, do as you have said. So um, in these uh, in these verses, oh, actually in three and four, we see um, the... And actually, it's it's actually three and five now that I look closely. But uh, in three and five, it says, he says, you know, my Lord, and this Lord is singular. This is just it's it's actually Adonai in or Adon in the the Hebrew. It's a singular. Um, but then he says, refresh yourselves, and that's plural. Now this isn't a big deal. I mean, obviously he he could be talking to one and then re mm -hmm. then addressing the others, um, but in light of everything else that that begins to happen, it's it's a little strange. Um, now the next thing that happens, and this is a little bit odd if we're really thinking about it, is in in verse five here it says, um, "Then they said, do as you have said." So then they, all three men. All three men said, or what? Like, what does that mean? They said, and it's just a simple sentence. You know, it's not that they told him to or something like that. It's, it's giving a quote. They said, "Do as you've said." So, are all three speaking as one? This, there's still tension. This is really kind of weird. Um, then in verse ten, uh, we have a very interesting thing. It it it's talks of them. Uh, so we're going to jump down. Um, verse nine. Oh, yeah, verse 9, we see the same thing. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? So, again, they're all speaking. But then in verse 10, it's it's in right in the same sort of conversation. It switches. So it says, they said, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you in the spring. And look, Sarah, your wife will have a son. So it just switches. It doesn't give us a... Who it is, it doesn't get, like usually with pronouns, you know, you start with the, the proper name and then you say he, but it's just like they said, then he said. Uh, so like are, they're all speaking, then one speaking. And again, it's it's just creating a lot of ambiguity about what's about who is talking and, and what they're all saying. Um, now we're going to jump down to verse 17. So then... Um, I'm going to start. Yeah, it says, Then Yahweh said, Shall I conceal from Abraham what I'm going to do? So now Yahweh is giving the name. Yahweh is speaking. And he's speaking to someone other than Abraham. So it's, it seems that this is one of the men speaking to the other men and saying, You know, shall I conceal from Abraham what I'm about to do? So definitely there's some interaction going on here. Um, Abraham will surely become a great and strong nation. All the nations will, of the earth will be blessed on account of him. So, um, oh, and but then if we keep reading, this is very interesting. It says, for I have chosen him. Just make sure I'm in good. Yeah. So it says, for I've chosen him and that he will command his children and his household after him that they will keep the way of Yahweh to do righteousness and justice so that Yahweh may bring upon Abraham that which he said to him. So that's weird because Yahweh is the one saying all this. Yahweh said, shall I conceal from Abraham what I'm going to do? 
for I have chosen him, he will command his children, and will keep they will keep the way of Yahweh to do righteousness and justice, that Yahweh may bring upon Abraham that which he, Yahweh, said to him. So in in this one sentence you have Yahweh referring to himself as I and to Yahweh as as someone else. Um and me, meanwhile and talking to these other men that, that are still kind of we're not sure who who or what they are. Um which is again very 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 interesting and very very strange. Uh and that's kind of the point I'm trying to get across is this is all very strange what we're seeing here and and I think that the strangeness is is intentional. Mhm. Yeah. So uh verse 21 and 22 um and this this is very interesting here. So this 21 says, "I will go down and I will see have they done all together according to its cry of distress." So he's talking about Sodom. Uh it says, "I will go down and I will see they have have they done all together according to its cry of distress which has come to me. If not, I will know." Then verse 22 it says, "The men turned from there and went toward Sodom." And Abraham was still sitting standing before Yahweh. So Yahweh said, I will go down. But then who goes down? The men go down. Well, that's kind of weird. Like, did, mm. are the men like, maybe there's, maybe this is totally disconnected and it's just, you know, but he says, I'm going to go down to see. And what happens in the next chapter is the men go down to see. Like, so is, are, are, is he saying the men are Yahweh? You know, this was one of those passages <laughs> as a kid. Mm-hmm. I always thought that that was Jesus because I wasn't told any. Yeah. I was, I didn't grow up in church, so no one told me. Mm-hmm. Jesus isn't in the Old Testament, so I just read it and. <laughs> like, oh, hey, there he is. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah. And um, when I mentioned that, I just naively, you know. When you're a girl, people just think you're dumb and everything you say is wrong. <laughs> I just naively um, would s- say things like that and people would be like, no, you're wrong. No. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, oh, okay, I must not know. I'm, I'm not a theologian, so. But <laughs> it is interesting that a child read that and thought, mm-hmm. maybe, oh, maybe that's Jesus, you know. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. And, yeah, and and this, yeah, as, as we'll see, this is going to get very interesting as it continues but yeah it's 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 there giving us this this real ambiguous picture of 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 god here's god appearing to abraham but but ex- what exactly is happening and there's a lot of disagreement about this passage you know is are all three men somehow representative of yahweh is this really like all three members of the trinity appearing in some sort of bodily form is this you know Yahweh and a couple of angels is it all three angels you know the traditional Jewish view is that it's all three just you know not not God at all even though it's pretty darn clear it is um you know they don't they don't like that uh, that view so they they typically say that it's it's all all angels but but yeah I mean what what is going on here so the uh so let's see where we were and and keep going because because it just keeps getting good um there we go so it says uh so i will go down and see and then um what happens next is is abraham please with yahweh to you know if will you spare the city if there's 50 or 45 or you know goes gets the number all the way down to to 10 i think um but then in verse let's go down to verse 33 oh uh, verse 33 it says then Yahweh left as he finished speaking to Abraham and Abraham returned to his place so the question though at this point so this is the point where Yahweh leaves it doesn't say where he left or how he left it doesn't say he disappeared it doesn't say he went up into heaven right it doesn't say it doesn't say he went down either you know it doesn't say he went down to the city at this point either so that's you know it, it could be that it might not be that we, we it's just really again it's, it's ambiguous it just says oh, he left he said he was going to go down to the city now he left so maybe this is where he's going down to the city and we're just kind of left to to infer that but but again it's 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 just ambiguous then we get into chapter 19 
and this is where we need to really use our our don't import stuff from from your current culture into the text. Eisegesis. Don't We're eise- all guilty. Don't eisegete this text. Yeah. Um, it says in verse 1 there, it says, Then the two angels came to Sodom in the evening. Now, for some people, this just settles it. Oh, they're angels. And and they have a ready definition of angel mm. that they've just you We've know, been told. Accepted. Touched by an angel. <laughs> Do you guys remember that show from the 90s? <laughs> Um, <laughs> that just dated me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so an angel, we, we understand an angel to be something that's a created spiritual being. You mm-hmm. know, maybe you think they have wings or something, but whatever. We, we think of them as that. And so we see that word and we just assume that. But again, the where has the text of Genesis up to this point defined that for us or, or told us that that's really what's what going on is, yeah. or what it is it, it hasn't it actually has not said anything of the kind so um so when we when we see angel what we should read is it, it the word literally in hebrew just means messenger and that's who's there you know the two messengers came to sodom this is obviously the two men who went down to sodom um but again it's kind of ambiguous who they are as we as we move forward in the in the text if you we go down to verse 13 and it says um it says for we are about to destroy this place because their cry has become great before Yahweh Yahweh sent us to destroy it well that's pretty clear right we the men have been sent by Yahweh, that's someone else, he sent us to destroy it. We're going to destroy it. Yahweh sent us to do that. Okay, awesome. Let's keep reading. Then Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were taking uh, his daughters and said, Get up, get out of this place, um, because Yahweh is going to destroy the city. So Lot interprets this as Yahweh is going to destroy the city. Not these angels are going to destroy the city, Yahweh is going to. And this ambiguity ambiguity just continues. Um, verse 21, um, it says, And he said to him, Behold, I will grant this favor as well. This is the, the angel speaking. He said to, to Lot, um, I will grant this favor as well. I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape quickly, for I cannot do this thing until you get there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. So, who's going to destroy the city? The angel's going to destroy the city. Um, but then, what does verse 24 say? It says, Yahweh rained down from heaven upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from Yahweh. Now, this verse is often appealed to on its own by Trinitarians to point to you know, plurality in the Old Testament. Look, there's like two Yahwehs here and they don't seem to be the same Yahweh. Like one is raining down from heaven upon, you know, raining down the fire and brimstone from uh, from Yahweh. Like from, is that another Yahweh? Some translations uh, say, well, the, the out of heaven part, they, they apply to the second Yahweh. So it says like from Yahweh out of heaven. Like there's a Yahweh in heaven and there's a Yahweh on the ground. And this is where we go back to what happened earlier in the text. Like, was it just, you know, when Yahweh said, I will go down, and the men went down, were the men the fulfillment of that, say, what he said? And therefore the Yahweh who called down, you know, who rained down the the, the fire and brimstone, is that the, the men, <laughs> or one of the men? Or did when Yahweh left, did he walk down to Sodom and Gomorrah and rain down fire from Yahweh. So it's it's a really again it's 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 just kind of a weird ambiguous text. And so but but remember what it, what it said just right before that was, you know, I cannot do this thing until you have gone to that city. You know, so so the man who's there is saying he's going to do it. But then it says Yahweh did it. So again, just ambiguities, like is which one is which or what's going on here. Um, so here's the, here's the thing, and this is what's 
for me really nails nails this down in in a big way more than it's more than just hey wow this is kind of interesting and oh trinitarians you guys you're always reading stuff into the text no um what's very interesting to me is that the later um prophets when they look back at this scene when they look back at this this occurrence of, of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah they maintain the same ambiguity that we found here in this text not only you know in verse 24 the weird to Yahweh thing but ev everything that we saw in the text you you see it in in later prophets as well for example let's take a look at Isaiah uh, Isaiah, where are you? There you are. 13, 17 through 19. It says, Look, I am stirring up the Medes up against them. This is Yahweh speaking, of course. Who do not value silver and do not delight in gold. And their bows shall shatter young men. And they will not show mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not look compassionately on children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor of the Chaldeans' pride, will be like when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Hmm. But this is Yahweh speaking. I mean, if you go further up in the text, you see Yahweh is the one talking. This is God. I mean, obviously it's God talking wow, the Drew. whole time. Wow. Um, yeah, see, I will make the heavens tremble because of the wrath of Yahweh. So there's, there he's speaking in the third person just like we saw down in the other text but yeah i will over i will destroy babylon just the same way that god overthrew sodom and gomorrah um jeremiah 50 verse 40 Oops. there we go so, <coughs> once again god speaking as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighbors declares Yahweh, no one will live there and the son of humankind will not dwell as an alien in her. So declares Yahweh as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. So once again, here God is referring to God as someone else doing this, this thing, uh, destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. And then of course, uh, the one that most... Anyone who's done a little bit of a plurality study in the Old Testament has seen this one, Amos 4.11, which just makes it even more clear. It says, I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were a stick snatched from the fire, and yet you did not return to me, is the declaration of Yahweh. So, it's... It's like when the prophets refer back to this this occurrence, they they saw that too. They saw, hey, look, this is weird. This is like ambiguously plural. There's two Yahwehs in the passage. Like, what the heck is going on? And they don't resolve that in later, you know, later writing. They just kind of reaffirm it. You know, God says in their writings, you know, the the words of God refer to the you know, when, when God is talking, I should say, you know, in the prophets, when God is talking, he, he refers to God in the third person, specifically talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. So, um, the there's two other points I want to make, and, and we'll, we'll wrap this up. But the the next point I want to I want to make is that if you is that right after this happens. And I'd have to check on this, but I, I've been told, I'm not, I haven't gone and looked at every Hebrew word to know if this is true, but I've been told the first time the word Elohim, which is God, is spoken by someone in the text of the Bible, is, is the verse we're about to look at. Um, so this is Genesis 20, uh, verse 13. This is Abraham talking to Abimelech and explaining kind of some of the things that have happened. And this you won't see from this text, but, but I, I've got... Uh, um, 
actually, I think I've got it. Oh no. Oh, do I? Hang on. Let's see if I got my stuff straight here. It appears I do not. Doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> okay. So here in verse 13, it says, this is Abraham talking. It says, and it happened that as God caused me to wander from the house of my father, I said to her, and he goes on and says what he said to her. Um, this phrase, God caused <coughs> me to wander. So God here is Elohim. That's, that's the, the Hebrew. And as we know, Elohim is, in a, is a plural form, but, but it's almost always accompanied by singular verbs. You know, if God does something, the verb is in a singular form. But this, when, when he says the word Elohim, this caused me to wander is one verb. And that verb is in the plural. So the first time he uses the word that we have a character in the Bible, a person speaking the word Elohim, which is plural, they use a plural pronoun, or sorry, a plural verb to talk about what God did. So, um, so that's really interesting, comes right after this crazy <laughs> uh, text about all this weird stuff. And then the very last thing I want to point out, and this is a little bit um, for you to, to maybe go and, and study, but there's something called the Masora. And when, and, and this is related to when, when you look up the Hebrew, you know, the Hebrew we have that underlies our, our Old Testament is called the Masoretic Text. Mm -hmm. um, and the Masoretic Text comes actually from well after Christ. It, it comes, you know, they date it differently or whatever, but, you know, at least 900 years to 1,000 years after Christ is when this text was put together. And it's what our, our Old Testament is based on. Um, people said for a long time, liberal scholars and stuff said well yeah that text is is not trustworthy it's it's late you know we don't know what it ever what it really said well then we found the dead sea scrolls and some of those scrolls are from the old testament and date back to and the scrolls themselves date back to before christ um, these are actual texts we have they're so old they're older than anything you know that we have in terms of of the bible old or new testament and they, behold, lo and behold, you know, they looked at the, the Dead Sea Scrolls and they compared it to what we have, and it's the same. You know, there, there, there are differences, but there are not major differences. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that um, the Masoretes who, who created the Masoretic text did is they, they, at some times, because of their own theological predilections for what, whatever reason, they didn't like to put the divine name Yahweh mm -hmm. in certain texts where it actually was there. And so they would replace it with Adonai and they would, um, they would make a note, uh, a specific kind of vowel pointing to say that this is what, what it was. And, and there's something, the Masora is sort of a, a companion stuff mm -hmm. that you see with, it's with the Masoretic text. It's not the actual Bible, but it's the, the notes sort of about what things they did and and so they were upfront about this in a way that I mean they weren't trying to hide it but they just didn't like it <laughs> just kind of turned out to be confusing for us later on though yeah it did um, so there are texts where it says Adonai in our in our Hebrew text and but we know from those notes that they they said actually this this said Yahweh before but we didn't like it you know or they I don't think they said we didn't like it but it was changed so there are two places in in Genesis 18 and 19 where the word Adonai or Lord, you know, which just could mean Lord or Master, it may, may or may not refer to God, um, is, re is actually a replacement of Yahweh. One of them is when in verse, in, in 18, 1 or 2, right at the beginning, when, when uh, Abraham runs out and says, my Lord, it says Adonai there, but it actually said Yahweh. So he immediately called, you know, we have his him calling them Yahweh, or, or maybe one of them Yahweh. Again, it's, it's ambiguous. And the second time is near the end of chapter 19, when Lot says to the angel, you know, oh, may it not, may it not be my Lord. 
you know, he's, he's trying to negotiate with where he's going to go. This is one of those other places where the Masoretes said, we put Adonai instead of Yahweh. Um, probably because, you know, may, I don't know. I'm not going to speculate. But the, the point is, this is a text that, that is sort of, it's, it's coming on the heels of three different ways Yahweh is, dis, is referred to in Genesis. His first three times he appears to someone in the Abrahamic narrative. And then this fourth time is just full of weird stuff. And, and weird stuff re regarding the identity of who we're talking to. Is, it, is, is Yahweh just one man? Is he, is he more than one of these men? Like, what's going on here? And, and, and I think that's on purpose. Because, again, as, as we'll see as we, we begin to study more, um, there's definitely a, a strain through the Old Testament that that begins to affirm a lot of these ambiguities about God in and and there's not really I mean you don't have to believe it the, the text doesn't tell you you it doesn't come down and say you have to believe it's one way or a different way but it just kind of leaves it up up in the air and this is why we begin to see a lot of things that, that happen mm -hmm. uh, at the coming of Christ in, in the New Testament. So um, that is what I've got for you today. Um, this has been an awesome show. We've, uh, Do we have got... time for the last couple questions? Um, yes. Let's go ahead. Uh, we will go ahead and do okay. last couple questions. So a couple of the questions I answered already, okay. but <clears throat> it's like always like, oh, do we have time? <laughs> um but I think that it would be good for the um, people watching that aren't in the live stream that mm -hmm. might not see my answers. Um, one gentleman asks about um, I, Jason. I, I don't know if I'm saying your name right. I'm sorry. Jason Sale. The mm -hmm. best theological book that teaches the Trinity that you recommend. And mm -hmm. so I told him Forgotten Trinity by James White. Unseen Realm by Michael Heiser. And also Drew has written a really good ebook that is free about the Trinity. And where mm -hmm. can they find that? Yeah, if you go to beginningwisdom.org, the website, it's linked in the description. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, if you open up the little side menu, sidebar thing, there's a little uh, free ebook thing. You just um, mm -hmm. subscribe for email updates. I don't really send a lot out in emails. So but, I, uh, Drew can't brag on himself, yeah. but the th the unique thing about Drew is he came out of a religion that did not believe the Trinity. And so his way of explaining it is really, really unique and really awesome. And I think really, I don't know, I think it's educational in a way that a lot of those other texts don't really cover. So mm -hmm. just, that's my biased opinion. Um, so yeah, you can, you can... Yeah, you can get it free for Kindle um, or whatever ebook you use or app you use um, just by uh, subscribing for email updates. I don't really send out a lot at this point. I think eventually I'm going to start sending out it like if I post a new blog or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, it's, it's free. And one other one I would recommend, uh, I haven't read it yet, I want to, but I've read a lot by this author, so I, I'm sure it's a great book. Uh, Robert Bowman, and he had a co-author, but I don't remember the name, um, wrote a book called Putting Jesus in His Place. And that book is entirely about the deity of Christ and how it's affirmed in every book of the New Testament. Um, they, they talk about different passages. Um, if you look up um, Trinity, like a uh, scripture study or something, he's got, I think his website is irr.org. Org, I want to say, is the one he started, Institute of Religious Research or something like that. You kind of might have to dig a little bit for it, but there's a scripture study for the Trinity where it's it's not a lot of reading, it's a lot of like items of of points of evidence and and all the scriptures that mm -hmm. back them up, and there's like hundreds and hundreds of of passages in there. Prager Frogger asks, does Drew's program allow you to see the Hebrew interlinear? Um, and I, he's talking about the Logos Bible mm -hmm. app, and I went ahead and told him if you click on a word, it shows it in Hebrew. Yeah. I'm not sure if it has an interlinear actually. It does. It, it does. can do interlinear. Too, awesome, yeah. wonderful, and that is free. 
we would love the, to the paid version eventually. <laughs> um, yeah. And then there's one more question about theonomy. That was really good. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Jay Mundell says, is a patriarchal society as shown in the law of Moses a good thing that we should pursue? Patriarchal means father rule. And mm-hmm. I think so. Mm-hmm. Um, God is over Jesus. Jesus is over the church. And, you know, our marriage is a mm-hmm. picture of that. And um, yeah. it's a beautiful thing when done right. Unfortunately, people have a bad a bad thought of patriarch- patriarchy. Yeah. Um, maybe because <laughs> they've been abused or they've seen chauvinism. Mm-hmm. Um, but when, you know, when the Holy Spirit is guiding you, that is nothing but a wonderful, wonderful thing as evidenced by how hard fatherless households have it. Yeah. So I thought I'd answer that so that you didn't come across as the, the <laughs> I agree with all that she said. <laughs> just like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the, the model that, that we're given. Mm-hmm. And um, now I don't think that means that there's, that it should be a society where like women have no rights or something like right, that. Right, 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 right. It's definitely been taken taken into bad places. Well, and God but, didn't even think that. Yeah. Zulufahad's yeah. daughters, they were allowed to own property. Yeah. You know, all the bad parts about it are what we did, not God. <laughs> right. Once again, please hit subscribe. That's that's um, something you can do to share the gospel without spending a cent is hit subscribe because once this channel hits a thousand subscribers, we're going to have the community tab and it's just going to be so much easier to reach more people. That's a really Mm -hmm. big milestone for all YouTubers. So awesome. All right. Well, we love you guys. We appreciate you being here. Uh, It's been a great show. See you next Tuesday. See you next Tuesday.